stand. Open up your red hymn books to 206. 206. And we'll close it off here. 206. All right. All right. Thank God for his wonderful grace. Amen. Thank you, Lord. All right. Wonderful grace of Jesus. Here we go. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise be? Grace for even me, broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise His name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching to all the lost. By it I have been born. grace for even me, broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame, oh magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise his name, praise his name, amen, amen. amen. praise his name, all right let's start off with a word of prayer, brother Tom can you open up the service with a word of prayer please? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for a lively crowd. It's really nice to hear all these amens. Thank you, Jesus. Huge encouragement. Lord, thank you for bringing all of us here safely, and thank you for granting us these parking spots. There are so many people here today, Lord. Um, thank you also for the missionaries and uh, Brother Turner and the uh, Brother Hanson and Brother Robinson who you know made their time to come down here, Lord. Amen. It's a true Lord, blessing to have you, them here. Father. We had great fellowship yesterday. It was great preaching, Lord. I pray that you'll please bless them with the Holy Spirit right now so that they may speak your words and Amen. help us encourage, and, you know, help encourage us so that we can work more for you, Lord. And I pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. You may be seated. Okay, so because we want to save time for our missionary, so we're going to cut it off right here. Uh, we're going to take up the Lord's offering. Now, just to let you all know, so we're going to take up a love offering after the missionary presents his work. So once he presents his work and does his preach, and when he finishes, and then I do the closing, we're going to do a love offering for our missionary. This offering is for the church, okay? It's not for our missionary. This is for the church. The next offering after this will be for our missionary, okay? All right, so if Brother Sean can come forward and take up the Lord's offering for us, and then if he can also ask God's blessing upon church service with the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you in prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. I want to first ask forgiveness of my sins, and I plead the precious blood of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Father. I feel a uh, great spirit in this room today, Father. I pray that you would not have anything to hinder the service today. I pray, Father God, that you would soften the hearts of everyone in this room that came to hear from you today, Lord God. I pray that you would fill the, the speakers with Holy Ghost unction, that they would give us what you've given to them to give us today, Father. And I pray that uh, you would have us give cheerfully and willingly, Lord. And uh, I pray that you would use this money uh, for the furtherance of your work and for your will, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.
Okay, so our missionary is going to come forward and then uh, present whatever the Lord laid upon his heart. If y'all can pay attention and then give ear and then see what God leads on his heart. Okay, go ahead, sir. All right, well, first thing I want to do is uh, apologize. I didn't bring my projector. I figured we're in Silicon Valley and I wouldn't need it. But I flew out without the projector and it's not the first time that that has happened. So I don't have a projector. So what I'm going to do is, uh, as I give my presentation, um, um, I'm going to pass around just kind of the book, and you can kind of look at uh, the area, Punta Arenas. If you haven't got a missionary card, grab a missionary card, and if you could pray for us. Now, I found a different way of praying for the missionaries. I, um, when I first started off praying, I put them in a photo book, and that worked okay, you know, and it, when I got my prayer closet there. And then uh, next thing we did is we put them on the refrigerators. I said, oh, put them on the refrigerators. You started praying for them. And this one guy, he, he said, Derek, I found a pretty effective way to do it where they at least get five to ten minutes of prayer. And I said, well, how's that? He says he puts them in a napkin holder, and then he puts it on the kitchen table. So every time they say grace, right before they say grace, they pray for the missionary. So I was like, hey, that's a pretty good idea. But we are the Hanson family. We're going to the Magellan region of Chile. So if you could pray for us every time you eat at the Chili's restaurant, I'd appreciate that. And every time you have a bowl of chili, you pray for us and thank for us. Hey, I'm just trying to get prayer. Um, that's a lot of prayer. Um, but uh, myself, Lisa is my wife, and my two boys, Hayden and Titus, they'll be going with us. One's 18, the other's 17. They're going to go for about a year, year and a half with us. And then I told them to pray and ask the Lord what direction the Lord wants you to go from there. Um, we did put on our prayer cards, Isaiah uh, 45, 22. It says, look unto, me, all you, look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. So we, we like that verse. It said all the ends of the earth. So that's where Punta Arenas, Chile is. It's at the very bottom of the very the very bottom tip of Chile. And so that's where we're going. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give a quick testimony of me. And uh, and then what we're going to do is I'm going to give the call to the area. And then I'm going to talk about the area. I grew up in Southern California, in San Bernardino, California. Grew up as a Lutheran. And I knew of Christ. I knew who he was. I knew uh, that he died on the cross, even for our sins. I knew all that, uh, you know, and but I didn't truly hear the gospel. It was more watered down. No one truly told me how to be saved. And I knew of him, but I never asked him into my heart. And maybe some of you out here, maybe you're a Catholic or Lutheran, and it's, you're under that same boat where, where you knew who God was. You knew who Jesus Christ was, but you didn't know how to be saved and how to go to heaven when you die. And so um, I grew up there for 28 years. I got on with the Forest Service, and then in uh, 1995, I took a job with the U.S. Forest Service Smoke Jumpers. And with that job, uh, that moved me to Missoula, Montana. And so I worked that year, and then I worked the next year in 96. And at the end of that year, we had a smoke jumper party, and I got drunk, and I drove my truck home, and I crashed it, and I got arrested for a DUI. Well, another smoke jumper by the name of Joe, he bailed me out, and he says uh, to me, Derek, are you born again? Are you born again? And um, I told him, man, that's not even the Bible. What are you talking about? And I didn't know. We didn't bring our Bible to church, and no one really explained being born again. Even though I heard the term, I had no idea what it meant. So um, I go back to Southern California, and that triggered a spiritual journey for me. Even though the Lord had already been looking for me and directed my path as a lost man in Missoula, Montana, um, I hadn't yet looked for him. And so I started looking for him, and I went to various churches down in Southern California. I went to the Mormon church, the Catholic church, many Lutheran churches, and I even went to a Baptist church and even a big non-denominational church. And at least at that one, they had an altar call, which we didn't really have altar calls. So I couldn't find the Lord, though. The gospel was watered down, and they didn't really tell me how to get saved. So I come back in 97, and that was going to be my last year in Missoula as far as I was concerned. I didn't care for Montana. I loved Southern California, and I said, okay, I'll do one more year. i got to face my charges, uh, my DUI charges, and do my community service and all that. So that was going to be my last year. And as we're doing refresher class, I, I would go by Joe's room, and I would he'd have the door open, and he'd have his Bible open, and he'd read it. And that triggered something in me. And, and you guys know you're a testimony at your job site. Even though people won't come up and say it to you, they're looking at you and they're watching you. And in the back of their mind, they're saying, there's something different about that guy. I know these other Christians, they don't open up their Bible. 
And that boy, that guy, he's kind of walking uh, uh, differently, and they'll notice yeah, you. Right. And it might take years before they might say something to you. But for me, I remember Joel bailing me out of, of jail, and I, I went up to him and said, all right, where do you go to church? Where do you go to church? Because I was still looking for the Lord, and I went to church with him. And uh, that first service, pastor, he was hollering and screaming. I'm like, that's crazy, man. We don't do that in a Lutheran church. They're nuts. I'm like, I like this, you know. And he comes down, and he says, Derek, if you died today, would you go to heaven? I said, well, I don't know. We'll figure it out then. He says, are you a Christian? And I answered that question, yeah, I'm a Christian. I always knew how to answer that question. And he looked at me and says, you are not a Christian. <laughs> so what I do, I got mad and left. Who is this guy? Who is this guy? But I came back. And it was because of that question for 28 years, no one ever asked me, if you died today, Come on. would you go to heaven or hell? That's right. And that's what I needed to hear. And I needed someone to get a little mad at me. And uh, I came back and I got saved. Hey, amen. Now that's not the end of the story. We uh, in August. So what's the next thing you want to do? What's a fruit of your salvation? You want to tell someone. You want to tell something about this great uh, gift you were given, about this gift of salvation. And so you want to go and tell someone. And so um, in August we went to the Winthrop, Washington smoke jumper base. Now. I didn't explain it, but a smoke jumper is a wildland firefighter that actually jumps from planes, and they jump close to the fire. And they're used mostly in the Northwest, but you even have one out here in Northern California at the Redding, uh, California Smoke Jumper Base. But so uh, we go to Winthrop, Washington, and we're helping them clean up their base. They were gone on lightning strike fires, and so the alarm goes off, and some of those jumpers came back. And next thing I know, there's eight of us circling around this fire in a plane, and they jumped the first four out. And so uh, we get the call, we're, we're just sitting in the plane, getting ready to go to a different fire, and we get the call back to us that we got two smoke jumpers hurt, and this is now a rescue jump. And so they jumped the rest of us out, and before they did, they told us one of these jumpers had a fractured femur bone and the other a possible fractured ankle. So they jump us out, and I land, and I had soft landing, and I could hear screaming, and I knew that was my fractured femur patient. I run over there to her, and I start checking on her from head to toe, and I pushed in on her hips, and she screamed even louder. Come to find out that uh, she broke her pelvic bone, dislocated her hip. And so we ended up getting her and the other jumper into the helicopter, and we got him over to uh, the hospital in Wenatchee. Well, the fires started to die down, and within the next uh, three to four weeks, I ended up back in Missoula at the smoke jumper base there and I got the idea that maybe I should write to all these guys. So that's what I did. I wrote to the helicopter repellers who helped us uh, uh, get these two jumpers to the Wenatchee Hospital. I wrote to all the smoke jumpers on that fire and I asked them, if you died that day on that fire, would you have went to heaven or hell? Now, a lot of them probably thought it was a little weird, but <laughs> one of them wrote back and that was that lady who got hurt on that uh, jump. She ended up hitting a rock out facing and slammed into it. And so uh, she was unsure, and I said, well, you need to get in that Bible. You need to look in the Bible and check to see if that Bible was true for yourself. And I took her to John and Romans and told her how Jesus Christ is God, but I said, you really need to check that out. I said, it's not in religion. It's not in religion. It's in the Bible. So she started checking it out, and I directed to her, her to a church down there in San Diego, and three to four months later, she got saved. So you know what I did next? I ended up marrying her. <laughs> so... That was my wife. That's our testimony of salvation. And maybe you have a, maybe you have, we all have different testimonies. But even if it's a testi testimony like Brother Kim, where you got saved in church, that the Lord looks at that um, and He says, "Wow, I can really use Brother Kim." And those those people who grew up in church, maybe you're out there in the, in the internet world there, and you're looking at this. The Lord is really pleased with that type of testimony. And I see those guys doing a lot more for the Lord. If you'll stay straight and you'll stay with the Lord. But um, so the next step, we just started serving in church. Just started serving church wherever we could. And um, in 2003, we took a missions trip to Honduras. And because we wanted to be missionaries, we were praying about it, and we felt that's the way the Lord was leading us. And so at the end of that trip, a missionary said, Derek, have you ever thought about the Falkland Islands? Here I am thinking Central America, that's where I'm going to go and serve the Lord. And he said, have you ever thought about the Falkland Islands? There's no independent Baptist church there in the Falkland Islands. And so um, we started research that area. So in 2009, I decided to take a trip down there. And uh, now you can only get there by either flying from London or flying from Santiago or Punta Arenas, Chile. And the cheapest way was actually going all the way down to Punta Arenas, Chile. So we went down there, or I went down there, and when I got down there in 2009, I found out you can only fly on a Saturday. And so um, 
that that trip was a bust at, at least i thought because uh, i wouldn't make my returning flight so i stayed in punta arenas chile and the lord started smote my heart about that area and about the chilean people and the chilean people is friendly with the falklands so but what the lord did in that was that he got me down there, but he closed that door to the Falklands, but he opened the door to that bottom part of Chile. And so in 2016, me and my wife, we took a trip down there and just making sure that that's where the Lord wanted us to uh, go and, and start a church down there. And so that's what we're uh, getting ready to do. We're getting ready to start a church down in Punta Arenas, Chile. And um, there's no independent Baptist church down in the area. There was one guy who went down there and started one, and then he left. But there hasn't been any type of independent Baptist church. Now, the reason I say independent Baptist church, do I believe other Christians can give the gospel out? Sure, I believe other Christians get the gospel out. But I believe that independent Baptist church in these last days are the one who's really, truly showing a person how to be saved and how they can know for sure they're going to heaven. There's a lot of that watered-down gospel that's out there, and people aren't sure about salvation and how to go to heaven. They're wondering if it's baptism. They're wondering if it's church membership. They're wondering all these other different things, uh, and they're really searching for God, searching for the Lord, Jesus Christ and so we're excited about the area I'm gonna pass this book out I'm gonna pass it around you kind of look at that I'm just gonna do that in the beginning but Punta Arenas is a is a city of hundred and forty thousand people it's at the very bottom and you can look at that map I have over there later on um, it is a southern they're called the southernmost city in the world but there's other cities that's even a little bit more southern than them but they're the one of the bigger areas so they consider them the southernmost city in the world and so um, we visited there we visit uh, um, Puerto Natales and Porvenir and I have yet to get down to Puerto Williams which truly is the southernmost right off of Cape Horn um, the Antarctic's about a thousand miles when we were there, uh, we found that there's a lot of European influence. People have come from all over to visit this area. It's a big tourist attraction, and they bring people from all over South America. A lot of people will come down there. They'll go to Puerto Natalis, and they'll go to what's known as Toro del Pines, known as the West Yellowstone of South America. I also have a National Geographic magazine over there, and, and they're right on the front of that magazine. And so people will come down there. They want to go to the Patagonia Range. They want to visit the area. It's cold. Um, it's known as the Alaska of South America just because of where it lies. And, and even at sea level, they'll get snow down in that area. Um, but the spiritual climate of the area... When we went down there, you, of course, you have a lot of Catholicism. It's about 67% Catholic in Chile. And then you have, um, I think the next 19, 16, 19% is Protestantism. And then you have 13% that's atheists. They're just tired of religion. They, they want the truth, but they're just tired of religion. They just, uh, uh, they see everyone's in it for a money-making scheme. And then 3% uh, is Mormon and 1% is Jehovah Witness. Now, when we were down there, uh, when I was with the missionary, he told me, Philip Robertson, he told me, he said, uh, now, Derek, because you're an American and because of where, where you're going, uh, they're going to assume you're a Mormon when you pass out a tract to the people. So I said, okay, so, you know, I don't like to take everything at face value. I want to try it out for myself. So um, we were down there, and we started passing out tracts, and my wife, she made sure we went to someone who was of that area, and it wasn't a tourist, because sometimes it's hard to tell. And so she went to a security guard, passed out a tract, and the first thing he asked was, are we Mormons? And so it's funny, but it's like if there's really Christians getting the gospel out, then how come they didn't assume? that they were Christians yeah, and wow. when we were in Utah one of the pastors out there said Derek do you know that the Mormons consider Chile their Utah of South America oh, wow. and that's where they've infiltrated the area and then you have the Pentecostals down there and there was some that was down there street preaching which we kind of rejoice in it but we have to wonder um, how much of the gospel they really gave them and then they never passed out tracts that we saw so we were down there for three weeks. We got 4,000 tracks out, and people were interested. We had someone who was thinking about committing suicide. You're going to have that with the long nights there in uh, Chile. And, but we had a lot of people wondering where our church was at, which we didn't have one, but we told them we would be back to start a church down in the area. So there is three Baptist churches, and there would be more like a, a Pentecostal mix, like a... 
uh, Bapticosto, I guess. And when we were down there at One Baptist Church, the uh, missionary that we were with, Brother Robinson, he said, uh, Derek, did you know uh, that there was something really neat with this church? And I'm like, what's that? He said, the pastor actually opened up his Bible. I was like, oh, okay, all right. And me and my wife, we visited another church, and there was a lady pastor there, but she really wasn't the pastor. We found out that they hired the Pentecostal to come in and do the services. So um, we've got a work to do down there, and we're excited about it, and we're ready. And if you could just keep us in prayer. I know I might have left a lot out, but you can ask me any questions afterwards, and I'll, I'll try to answer them for that area. We are what's currently known as deputation as missionaries. We're on deputation. We're about anywhere from 80 85%, somewhere in there for our support. We have already bought the tickets. We'll be leaving in January. And we're excited about that. And the deputation process, usually a missionary is anywhere from two to four years out trying to raise money to be able to go to the foreign country. So um, sometimes you get missionaries in here who have been, been to the country and they've been over there and they served there for a while. And then you're gonna get other missionaries out on deputation. Maybe that'll help you out when you see missionaries. Now, if you could take your Bible and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Yeah, let me see. All right. I left some time there. 1 Corinthians and chapter 10. Like I said, I will have, um, if you guys have any questions afterwards, I know I'll just give you a couple questions real quick before we get started on the message. I've had people ask me, how cold is it? How hot is it? You know, what's, uh, uh, what's it cost down there? Those kind of things. Um, it doesn't get real cold like Alaska, it'd be more like Juneau, it rains a lot, it is the fourth windiest city in the world, um, but the coldest it's ever been is minus six, which uh, Pastor Robinson does that in his sleep, so, and that was the <laughs> coldest ever um, recorded, and then the hottest ever recorded, it's 83, so, you know, it's, it's on, uh, uh, it's close to the sea and everything, so you're going to get those temperatures in there where it keeps it 20 to 40 in the winter and then 50 to 60 in the summer. And then um, it is more expensive just like Alaska also um, just because you have to import and export a lot of the stuff into that area. They're paying anywhere from four to five dollars a gallon of gas and you guys here are like yeah that's what we pay. Um, <laughs> but you know you're paying for a pair of jeans it's about 50 bucks and so rents uh, I know I know where you guys are at. Rent, <laughs> rent down there is about 800 to 1200. You're like, that's not, that's not bad. <laughs> but other areas of the U.S. that is bad. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, I want to talk about a fire escape, and we'll start there at First Corinthians and chapter 10. And let's start there in verse six. It says, now these things were examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, as is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day, three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur you as some of them also murmured and destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for ensamples, and they are written for admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Verse 13, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted, above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your mercies. We thank you for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, which cleanses us from all our sins, Lord. And I thank you, uh, Lord, that you sent a chosen vessel in Joel, to get me to church and then another chosen vessel and pastor john hapman uh, to lead me to the lord father and lord uh, uh i know we're going out to chile to win people but there's a missionary field right here in san jose and san francisco with a lot of immigrants coming to this area even lord and so i pray you help this church as small as it is lord be mighty in getting the gospel out, Lord, and uh, them serving you, Father. Lord, now I just pray you help me move out of the way and that the Holy Spirit would talk through me, Father. We love you. We thank you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. In verse 13, it says there that um, God is faithful, and it says he will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptations also make a way to escape 
that ye may be able to bear it. So the Lord's going to bring an escape from the temptation when it comes if we're willing to ask him. Now, in this verse, Paul's talking to the Corinthian church, and what we're going to do is we'll go to uh, uh, 1 Peter, and then we're going to go to Genesis, and we'll be in Genesis 19 for a little bit, and then we'll come back to 1 Corinthians 10. But Paul is speaking to the Corinthian church, one of the more carnal churches here, and he starts off there in the very beginning. He's talking about an example with Moses and what happened to them. And in verse 5 it says, But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. And then he goes on to explain to the Corinthian church not to do some of these things, and this is an example. And he is trying to help them out to be able to um, escape from temptations. Let's take our Bibles, and I'm sorry, go to 2 Peter, 2 Peter, not 1 Peter, 2 Peter and chapter 2. 2 Peter and chapter 2. We have temptations that come every day. They come and want us, and that temptation will come and get us to sin. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2. It says, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, Condemn them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot. Now that doesn't mean he only delivered Lot, but in the Lord's eyes, Lot was just. And he's a type, as you know, uh, he's a type of the backslidden Christian. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked for that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds and you got to be careful because that can happen to you in the workplace when you especially when you get in to jobs like construction or firefighting or police work and um, uh, some of those jobs you got to be very careful maybe I left out some jobs but you just got to be careful that you don't let that affect you and you got to continue um, sowing that seed and so there's Lot, and he was vexed his righteous soul from day to day. Now it says here in 9, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and reserve the unjust in the day of judgment to be punished. So either the Lord knows how to do it or he doesn't know how to do it. Either the Bible's right or it's not. And the Bible says he knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation. Now take your Bible and go to Genesis 19. He knows how to deliver you out of temptations. And the question is, are we willing to identify when temptations come and are we willing them to get in, them, to get in those temptations under the blood of Christ? Look at Genesis and chapter 19. Now in 18, you know, if you know your Bible, in Genesis 18 you have... You have Abraham going before the Lord, and he says to the Lord, Lord, if there is uh, 50 righteous, will you spare the city of Sodom and Gomorrah? And he goes on, you know, what about 45, 40, what about 30, 20? He gets all the way down to 10. And our Lord, who is merciful and just, says, Abraham, if there's 10 righteous, I'll spare the city. And I'm sure Abraham was starting to count on his fingers, and he says, let me see, I got a lot there. I got his wife. I got the two daughters, I got the two sons, laws there's six. Surely they affected four more people. Surely there's ten people in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And yet there wasn't. Now I know our Lord and that, that He's merciful and just. And I think if there was five righteous in that wicked city, He would have spared the city. You know why some of these cities here in America, and maybe especially these cities here, why he hasn't destroyed it is because there's some righteous people in these cities that are still serving and still getting the gospel out. What happens when we get taken up out of here? My, oh my, no one wants to be here when we get taken up out of here because there won't be any more righteous in these cities. And so here... We're going to pick it up. The Lord's getting ready to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. He can't find 10 people. So we're going to start off there at 15. It says in 15, when the morning arose, then the angels hasten Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. Verse 16, And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters. The Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth, and set him without the city. And it came to pass, when they had brought him forth abroad, that he said, Escape 
for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. So here in 15, uh, the two angels, they come to Lot and they say, look, time to get out. It's time for you to get up, get out of your bed, get out, because there's a fire coming. There's a fire coming. And what the Lord will do is he'll start smoting your heart and he'll say, hey, Derek, don't get in that temptation. It's going to turn to a sin. Don't do that, Derek. You need to get out of that thing. It's going to get a hold of you. And so a lot of times we're, we'll, we'll kind of brush it off a little bit and we'll kind of linger a little bit and we'll be like, I don't know, I think I'll be all right in this. I've been doing fine. And look at 16. So he gives him a warning there in 15. Then he gives him another warning in 16. It says, and while he lingered, the men laid hold upon. So now here's what happens. They come and they got to physically get Lot and the two daughters and his wife out of Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's what the Lord will do a lot of times. He'll come and he'll have to physically help you get out. I mean, after he tells you and tells you, who knows how many warnings you get, but he's telling you and he's telling you, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And then finally, maybe something happens, like maybe you're watching something you shouldn't be watching on TV and that TV goes off. And you can't explain why that TV, that's the Lord, he's physically trying to get you out of that temptation. He's trying to help you. But you know what we want to do? We want to stay there. What we want to do is we want to hold a grudge with someone. And we say, Lord, now this person did me wrong. Now I'm just going, I'm going to get this thing taken care of, Lord, but not until he understands. I mean, I'm mad at him. I'm a little upset at him. So I'm going to, I'm going to hold on. I'm going to stay here in this temptation. Look, now you won't say it like that, but you'll say, I'm just going to, I'm going to be a little bit mad because I want him or I want her to understand that I'm angry. And what you do is you hold on to that bitterness and maybe you hold on to a little bit too long thinking that you can get out of it. Remember what we saw in verse 12, wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. And so we'll hold on to that a little bit longer and we'll linger there. And the Lord will do something. Maybe the Lord interrupts your thought. Maybe you're getting ready to think of something lustful and he, he brings something along, a phone call, something to interrupt that thought process to get you out of that temptation. Now we got to recognize that. That's our problem. We get so inundated with everything that's going on in this world, and we don't get alone with God enough that we got to recognize, all right, maybe that was of the Lord. All right, okay, I'm going, all right, thank you, Lord, for interrupting that so I can see that. Because maybe you're stubborn like me. I'm stubborn. It takes warning after warning after warning. The Lord says, I'm like, okay, Lord, I'm way down here now. i got to get, all right, uh, thank you for putting me down there. But uh, I want to do right now, Lord. It's about time. What you been waiting for, Derek? You know, so verse 17, now. Now when he gets your attention, here's what he do, does. When he gets your attention, verse 17, And it came to pass, when they had brought him forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life, look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. So he says, all right, I got your attention now, Derek. Now here's what you need to do. Now you need to go over here to the plain. Or you, you, I'm mean, sorry. You don't need to go over here to the plain. Don't go there. I don't want you to go there. You need to still escape from the fire, but you need to go way up there in that mountain. You need, get, you need to just keep traveling, just keep running, just keep wa run, walk, whatever, but get to the mountain. Don't go there. Don't go there. I want you to go there. So when he gets your attention and you're in that temptation, you're getting ready to sin or maybe you've already started to sin, he says, look, get alone with me. Go way on up there and get oh, way God. far away from this world Amen. and don't get close to the world I want you to get away now I might make you come back to the plane but for right now just get away you're gonna be consumed the fire is coming and that fire of temptations coming the Lord says get along with me for a little while get way up there in the mountain <laughs> You know what we do? We start to come up with our own plan. We start to devise something. We start to say, well, Lord, uh, hmm. now I got a better plan than that, Lord. Now hear me out. Let me tell you what my plan is. And that's what happens. Look at 18 lots said unto them. Oh, not so, my Lord. He says, 19, behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed to me and saved my life, and I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me, and I die. Behold, now this city is near to flee unto. It's a little one. Oh, let me escape hither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. So what we do is we say, look, Lord, I'm a little tired. That mountain's uh, pretty far away, Lord. Um, this is just a small city. And, Lord, I understand that I'm getting into a temptation. I, I get that, Lord. But I think I will do better here in the plain of Zor. Lord, that's just a little too far for me to go. And I don't have the time. I don't got the time. I'm just going to do something a little small for you. And, look, I... I, 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 I'm saved. I'm going to church. 
I, I'm, I'm doing things right. You've magnified your mercy on me. So, you know, I've, I've been through this, Lord. I'll be all right just right over here. I'll be comfortable. I don't want to do too much for you, Lord. Uh, that guy going up the mountain, man, I look at him, man. He, uh, Man, he's whacked. He's weird, Lord. And who knows? I haven't seen him in a while, so maybe something evil got him. And we'll bring in that spirit of fear and that spirit of worry, and we'll say, I'm just going to try something over here. I'm just afraid. That's just a little too far. Look at 21. And he said unto them, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow the city for which thou hast spoken. Haste thee, escape hither. Uh, for I cannot do anything till thou become hither. Therefore the name of the city was called Zor. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zor. So here we got um, the two angels saying, all right, I accept you in this thing. And you need to get out still, though, because the temptations come in the sense. You need to get out. Go ahead. Go to that. You don't want to listen to me? Go ahead. Go to the plane. I told you where to go. You ain't going to live. Go ahead, man. Go ahead. Have, have a fun time at that. And, you know, a lot of times when we don't get the thing right with the Lord, the Lord says, all right, if that's what you want, you're going to get no peace and joy. That's why some of uh, you, you backslidden Christians don't have no peace or no joy or no victory. You just want to do do the the minimum you want to do not as much and you're just like i, I don't want to go i don't want to really follow your will in romans it talks about a perfect a good and an acceptable will now with that acceptable will you say oh i'm just gonna do the acceptable stuff with that comes uh punishment now whether it's down here or whether it's up at the judgment seat that's to be determined but i do know this look at verse 26 but his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Now, let me ask you this question. This is a what-if question, okay? What if they kept traveling to the mountain? What if they kept going, they kept hiking, and they just kept traveling and traveling? I wonder if that fire would have swept through there, because it says it only took them a day's journey. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered in Azor. So it was real close by that city. And I just have to wonder, did she look back and miss her friends? And uh, that's why she looked back. She became a pillar of uh, salt. What would have happened? They just kept traveling. Would she have not looked yeah. back? Would she got to the top and everything would have been destroyed? And the Lord said, all right, you guys can look back now. And they all looked back. I just have to wonder. I do know that she looked back, though. And they went a small journey. And so that's what we do a lot of times. We get in a comfortable place. And we want to look back to the world. And we don't want to fight temptation anymore. We don't want to escape from that. We just want the easy route. Now, on August 15, 1949, a crew of 15 of the United States Forest Service elite airborne firefighters, the smoke jumpers, would jump out into a raging fire. When all was said and done, only three would be alive. This was going to be known as the Man Gulch Fire. It was in Helena, Montana. Now, what happened? Most of these men, they had intense fire training. Uh, they were college-educated men, and they were known as infallible firefighters. They were perfect, according to uh, the Forest Service at that time. They could do no wrong, and if anyone can handle these little lightning strike fires, I'm sure they can't, could. You know, a lot of times we're kind of like those guys in that we don't think we've sinned in a while. And uh, so, therefore, we don't get under conviction and we don't get sin taken care of we don't get temptations taken care of and you, we think well i didn't murder anyone i didn't kill anyone i didn't steal i didn't i didn't i don't really lie and then you forget some of the other verses wherefore unto him that knoweth to do good yeah. and do with it not it is sin uh, whatsoever is not of faith is sin Amen. so you know we, we always look at those big ones those yeah. big sins and we forget man that we sin every day therefore we have to confess our sin uh, every day but we get to a people get to a point where they think that they're perfect so these firefighters figured out we can handle this fire we can handle this fire and uh, so they get up around the, the fire they're circling around in the plane and the uh, man in charge his name was Wade Dodge he was going to be the foreman of the fire and he looks down at the fire and Dispatch calls him back and says, we have a lot of lightning strike fires here. Um, uh, brother uh, or Wade Dodge, can you handle this fire, you and your boys? He looks at the fire, there's a little smoke going up. He says, don't worry about us. We got it. We'll be back by nightfall. We'll be back by ni nightfall. We got this one taken care of. And so right there, they cut off communication. 
Careful you don't cut off communication with the Lord. And so they cut off communication, and what they saw was two ridges going about like this, about 45, and in between was Man Gulch, and below them was the Missouri waters. And so on one ridge they had tall grass, and on the other was timber, and that's where the fire was. It was towards the bottom, and there was a little smoke going up. And so Wade Dodge figured we'll, we'll, we'll jump about midway on this ridge, and then we'll start to uh, head downhill, and then we'll go down the gulch, we'll come back up, and we'll put a line around the fire, and we'll have that thing taken care of. So that's what they did. They jump out, they land about mid-ridge, and then uh, his men started to hike down towards the fire. And as they started to hike down, Wade Dodge would watch the fire. And by that time, a patrol guard came up by the name of Harrison, and he had him go down with his men, and he's still watching the fire. And the men are getting closer towards the bottom. They're going about a side slope there and uh, starting to head down that gulch a little bit. And that's when he saw the fire start to take off. He felt the winds picking up and he saw, sees that fire and it goes down the gulch. And then it starts to go back up that hill. And then it comes up around this way and it's coming up that gulch. And what Wade Dodge realized at that moment was that his men was trapped and that there was only one way out, one way from the fire escape and that was straight up the mountain. If they could make it to the top, if they could make it to the top of the mountain, they would be safe. That's all they had to do was make it to the top of the mountain. And so Wade Dodge started to uh, hike down a little bit, and he started to yell at his men. He says, "Let's go! The fire's coming! The fire's coming! Drop your tools! Run! Run!" Now some of the men dropped their tools and started running. Others didn't see a need. Uh, uh, there was no urgency in in the call to drop the tools and run. And they're looking at it and they're like, oh, I could make it, it's not that far. Far. It's the same as Christians. There's no urgency in getting rid of temptation. We believe we can handle it. And there's a fire coming. And so some of the men uh, dropped their tools and they just started running. And Wade Dodge is looking at the top and he's seen how fast that fire is moving. It's, it's gotten into that tall grass. And those men came up, uh, up that ridge and they started uh, running towards Dodge. And he says, go, go. And then he looks at the top and he says, there's no way they're going to make it. He takes a match and he lights that grass on fire. And he did something that was controversial back in that day. And they were deciding whether or not that they should be doing this uh, fire practice. And what he did was he started a frontal fire that took off. And then his idea was the men, all they have to do is lay down in the black and they'll be safe. Because he's just looking at the top. There's no way all his men could get in. And so as he's doing that, for the first three firefighters come up. They're watching Dodge, and off they go. And Wade Dodge tries to warn him. He says, boys, come back. But by that time, they're too far up, and they don't hear him. And so the next guy up is Hellman, and Hellman is second in charge. If he reaches Hellman, he can reach the rest of the men. So he says to Hellman, Hellman, get in the black. Look, we're going to lie down in the black. You'll be safe if you get in the black. And Hellman says... The heck with that. And then he couldn't get another person in that black with him. It's kind of like the preacher. And when the preacher preaches from the pulpit, and he says, look, hell is real. You will die and go there. You will burn forever. And we're not happy about that. But you need to get born again and ask Jesus Christ in your heart to save you. And you say, I'm going to try another way. Or my religion says, that's not the way. And you look at the top of that mountain, you say, oh, I can make it. That's what Hellman did. Hellman looked at the top of the mountain, and he says, I can make it. I can make it to the top. And people will try all these other good works. Go to, uh, go to Matthew 7 real quick. And Hellman had his eyes, his focus on the top of the mountain. Matthew chapter 7. People just believe that there's no way a good and loving God, and He is good and loving and merciful uh, to us, that there's no way because we didn't do any really bad sins that He would send us to hell. So look at Matthew 7 and 21. It says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Now these people are saying, Lord, Lord. So they believe that they are saved. So he says, not, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter in the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say, will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and that in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. People are doing things in the name of the Lord. They're giving to people. They're giving them food and clothing, and they're saying, I do this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so people are doing all these good works, and uh, uh, they're doing it in Christ's name, and they're even prophesying. Maybe they're getting on Facebook and posting things about Jesus Christ, and they're like, oh, yeah, you know, I did this, I did that, yeah, Lord. I mean, they think they're going to get up to heaven, and the Lord's going to accept some of these Praise. things that they did, some of these works right. that they did, thinking <laughs> that they're going to go to heaven and then look at 23 and you know it and then will I profess unto them I never knew you depart from me that work iniquity question is did you truly get saved if you got saved were you lost if you weren't lost and what are you getting saved from you had to have been lost in order to get saved you can't be born into Christianity you can't even use that term saved if you were never lost because there's nothing you're getting saved from so there's hell men now he makes it to the top. He makes it to the top. He's like, I made it. He dies the next day from his burns. A lot of people will think, I'm going to be with the Lord because I've done a lot of good works. I know I'm going to be in heaven. I, my heart of heart just tells me so. And we know what that heart is. It's, de it's deceitful and desperately wicked. And they're going to stand at the great white throne judgment rather than the judgment seat of Christ. And they're thinking they're going to make it just like Hellman. In our temptations, we think we've got it made because we've been a Christian for so long. And that we can get the victory over these temptations by sure willpower. And not really going to God and asking God and, and actually admitting the sin. Admitting the temptation that we got involved in and saying, Lord, I am bitter. Lord, I am a liar. Lord, I am proud. And we don't do that much anymore in Christianity and then confess them before the Lord. Now, those first three that took off, they, they, they saw something off in the distance. And they went, they went uh, toward a rock outcropping that they saw. And they made it to that rock outcropping. But the third guy that was with them looked back up at the top of that hill. And they found his body eight feet from that rock outcropping. Now those two other guys, they stayed on that rock outcropping, and it's never too late to accept the rock, which is Christ Jesus. Amen. You might be going the wrong way, and you might think you've got it made, and you might be getting towards the end of your life. You're like, I got this thing made. I've, I've trusted in this religion, or I've trusted in that, and it's never too late to humble yourself and That's say, right. I can't do it. I need that rock. I need a sure Amen. foundation, which is Jesus Christ. Now they started to, they got on that rock and they saw Dodge and they saw that fire coming up right next to them. They saw what Dodge, they understood what Dodge was doing. And so Dodge is going to have to lay down in the black because the fire is coming. And just like he said, true to his word, that the fire would go around him. Dodge told those guys, look, get in the black. The fire will go around us because this would have already burned off. And that's what happened. But with fire, it creates its own storm. It can create its own wind. And what that wind can do, it can get so strong that it can pick a man up and it can slam him down and that's what it did it picked them up it slammed them down picked them up and slammed them down and if you'll get in Christ Jesus and start serving him stay humble stay low get down and you don't get up and say I can do this myself I got these temptations figured out and if you'll stay low and say God I am a sinner I've done this and I've done that and Lord please help me Lord says I like that guy I'm gonna give that guy some more of that Holy Spirit because that guy he admits it he's not he's not afraid to admit it but a lot of times we want to do our own thing and we think we got this thing handled and Dodge stayed low and he was safe and you'll stay safe from that fire that's coming but we want to do our own thing a lot of times now they said this about Dodge and I'm gonna finish it up this is a this is a song uh, that they made of Wade Dodge Wade Dodge was blamed he was blamed for the death of those men when it when it was all said and done he did the right thing. He tried to save their lives. When it's all uh, uh, today and in the future, people are going to blame you for doing things the wrong way when you're witnessing to them and telling them about Jesus Christ. And you're trying to warn them. And they're like, oh, if he, they would have witnessed to me better, I might have got saved or whatever they say. But you're trying to warn them. And that's what Dodge did. He tried to warn them. And here's, what, here's how the song went. I won't sing it for you. You're thankful for that. It says, my name is Dodge, but then you know that. It's written on the chart there on the foot end of the bed. They think I'm blind that I can't read it. I've read it every word, and every word it says is death. 
Soul confession is that the reason that you came. Get it off my chest before I check out of the game. Since you mention it, there's just 13 things I'll name, 13 crosses high above the cold Missouri waters. August 49th, North Montana was the hottest day on record. And the forest tender dry, lightning strikes in the mountain. I was crew chief at the jump base. I prepared the boys to fly. Fell the tap upon the leg that tells you to go. See the circle of the fire down below. Fifteen of us dropped above the cold Missouri waters. Gauged the fire I'd seen bigger. So I ordered them to side hill and we'll fight it from below. We'll have our backs to the river. We'll have it licked by morning even if we take it slow. Then the fire crown jumped the valley just ahead. There was no way down, headed for the ridge instead. Too big to fight it, have to fight that slope instead. Flames one step behind above the cold Missouri waters. Sky was turning red, smoke was boiling. 200 yards to safety, death was 50 yards behind. I don't know why, I just thought it. I struck a match to waste high grass, running out of time. Tried to tell them, step into the fire, I set. We can't make it, this is the only chance you'll get. But they cursed me, ran for the rocks above instead. I lay face down and prayed above the cold Missouri waters. And then I rose like the phoenix and the world reduced to ashes. There were none but two survived. I stayed that night and all day after. Carried bodies to the river, wondering how I stayed alive. Thirteen stations of the cross to mark their fall. I've had my say. I'll confess to nothing more. I wonder, Christian, what your, at, at your funeral, what they will say about you. Did they curse you? Did you try to tell them? Did you warn them that there was a fire coming, that you are going to die and go to hell? And I know you got to use discernment with people because you want to see them get saved. Uh, but did you warn them? Yeah. Did you tell them? And uh, Wade Dodge, he wasn't looked at a hero till after he died. Till after he died, he was looked at as a hero and that he did try to save those men's life. But when, but when it was all said and done, he was enemy number one within the Forest Service. But that changed, that changed. And I'm just going to leave you with this in 1 Corinthians 10. We see right before the temptation in 12, it says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. So you think there's no sin or temptation that, that has come your way in a long time or you've been involved with. You might want to ask the Lord again. That might be why you don't have peace and victory because you haven't been, you haven't been uh, claiming those sins and telling the Lord that you have done those things. And then when you confess him and you ask him, it says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common a man. So don't think that uh, no one else has been through it. And it says, God is faithful, and he will not suffer you to be tempted that above that you are able. So maybe you're having a problem with a certain sin. But it says there, he will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. You just got to ask him. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape? So you say, Lord, I, I'm really struggling with this one temptation, with this one sin. I just can't get the victory over it. And uh, have you asked him? Have you, have, have you said, Lord, Lord, I need help. Do whatever it takes to help me. Now, that's what we don't want to say. <laughs> we don't want to say, do whatever it takes, because the Lord will say, okay, that's what you want. <laughs> but, amen. Pastor Kim. Amen, amen, amen. Every head bowed, every eye shut. The altar call is open. If the Holy Spirit led upon your heart to come on the altar, don't be shy. Feel free to come. If uh, We don't force altar calls, so if you don't want to come down forward, that's fine. You can pray in your seat. Every head bow and every eye shut. Here's a time that we give to you where you can self-reflect. See what sins. And like the missionary said, take heed lest he fall. Oh, I'm King James only. I'm dispensational. I'm a Bible believer. But you know what? King David, didn't he fall? And he committed grievous sins. Take heed lest he fall. Sometimes you're not as spiritual as you think you are. And you got to check your life and say, I got to look at every nook and cranny. I got to repent, get right. And those things that you think that, well, I don't need to repent of those things. I mean, I mean... 
Look at me. I've been to church. I've always done soul winning and did street preaching. I'm a Bible believer, and Satan's going to use that bride. And he, isn't he supposed to be a king of all the children of pride? And then he will use that nook and cranny where you got, where you will fall. If there's some sin that you need to escape and you need to get your heart right with God, that's what Calvary's for. Jesus, Jesus shed his precious blood to die on the cross and wash away all your sins. You know what the problem with mankind and this whole world is, is that we truly trust in our own works. And it's not just lost people, it's even Christians, Bible-believing Christians, saved, washing the blood. We trust in our works. We're like Matthew 7. We're like Matthew 7. Lord, Lord, have we not done all these wonderful things? And I guarantee you this, you'll be saying that at the judgment seat of Christ. You're going to be talking like that lost person at the great white throne. And at the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to go, Lord, Lord, remember that I stood for your book and I never compromised. And, you know, I stayed away from sin, made sure that my testimony was clean. And Look at you looking at your own works again. You can't admit you're rotten, you're a loser, you're nothing without Jesus Christ, and that you need to humble yourself and be broken and say, God, all I am is nothing without Jesus Christ, and I need you to wash my sins with your blood, and I mean everything, Lord, I throw it on the altar. Have that repented of and washed under the blood and give it up to the Lamb. You've got to realize that's what the Lamb is for. Don't make his sacrifice in vain. I mean, his blood is not only there for your salvation, but also for your, conf uh, for your fellowship. 1 John 1, 9. Confess your sin. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all, all unrighteousness. Don't waste that sacrifice of the lamb. He loved you that much to die for you. Now put it to good use and live for him. We don't want to rush altar calls or your prayers. If you want to still pray in your seat or... Pray here on the altar's floor. Take your time. The rest of you who are done, uh, please take out your uh, white hymnal. Please take out, uh, not your white hymnal, red hymnal. <laughs> red hymnal. I keep saying white for some weird reason. Okay, take out your red hymnal and then uh, open up your red hymn books to 381 and please stand. If some of you want to keep praying, go ahead. Take your time. 381. 381. In your red hymn books. You can't get sweet peace until you lay it all on the altar. Amen. All right, amen. All right, we'll skip verse 2. Here we go. You have longed for sweet peace and for faith to increase and have earnestly, fervently prayed.
right, you all may be seated. You all be seated. All right, we're going to take up the Lord, uh, the love offering. We're going to take up the love offering. And then, uh, Brother Brother Robert, do you mind doing the honors of the love offering for us, actually? All right, so this in this love offering, what I want you to do is to please address your check, if you're going to write on a check, to Derek Hansen, okay? So uh, his last name is H A N. S E N. Okay, so please direct it toward him. If you write to San Jose Bible Baptist Church, that's not going to the missionary. It's going to us. If you don't want pastors to get more rich, okay, then you can take Amen. it. Amen. Right. So this is for our missionary. All right. Want that. And, uh, <laughs> so I'm sure y'all. Uh, appreciate the preaching that he gave as well as the presentation so we want to show him how much uh, we love him in the Lord you know and the best way to show how much you love him in the Lord is not to pray for him but to give him money I'm just kidding <laughs> I'm just kidding but it's it's everything it's it's your giving your prayer and whatever you do for him all right now of course there are some people who can't give much don't feel guilty about that we have some members in our church who can't give more than a couple dollars that's a widow's might that the Lord will bless and honor okay so the Lord he always makes up the money he, I never failed one time we only had like four people in the room when our missionary came and I was like oh man we don't have enough money but then uh, we were able to give the missionary about 600 something because there was one person who gave whatever what was in his pocket to the Lord. So just give what you can give to the Lord, and the Lord will bless and honor it. All right then, so Brother Robert, if you can open up the love offering with a word of prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for that good preaching, Lord God. And yeah. thank, you for, thank you for gathering us all in your room, Lord God. And thank you for the altar call, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the opportunity to confess anything that was on our heart, mm -hmm. anything that was hidden to us, Lord God, and put it on the altar to burn up before you, Lord God. And may it be presented a, a sweet and, and great smell to you, Lord God, and I hope that you're pleased with everybody. Amen. I know that you're pleased with everybody in this room, Lord God, because we, we all have a heart for you, Lord Jesus. Uh, I hope you enjoy the great songs we, we sing for you today, Lord God, and may this be a cheerful giving, Lord God, and may Amen. you bless uh, our missionary brother uh, Hanson here, and it seems like uh, he's a great man, Lord God. I know that that, that preaching really touched my heart. Amen. Lord, and, and all this I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Uh, while the love offering is going around, I am very happy to say this. So um, the Lord has uh, blessed us with enough money. Despite of this area being one of the most expensive places in America, what, you pay a one-bedroom apartment average 2000 That's crazy, you know? I don't know if Brother Turner remembers, but I remember when I spoke a testimony at Dr. Upman's church, I was like saying, the Lord provided a miracle. I'm paying a place where I pay only six fifty a month. And then some of these people were like going, that's expensive because <laughs> Pensacola was a lot cheaper that time. But uh, anyways, the, what I'm happy to say is because uh, the money, you've been very much giving to the Lord. So now we can finally support our seventh missionary, right? So Amen. Brother Missionary Hansen will be able to support you, praise the Lord. So I'm very happy to say that. So thank you so much. The, the money is fine. I can see it growing throughout the past months. So we're not just giving away foolishly, okay? So thank God for you guys. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. 
So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.